Uh, let's begin with a prayer and we'll jump right into it, shall we? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. <clears throat> so thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Just before we begin, very quickly, uh, a uh, priest, uh, Father Paul, who is sitting in the far back corner of the room, uh, accompanies, us, accompanies us sometimes on these uh, visits, and he is Canadian and will be returning back to the States with us. He was in New Zealand speaking at the Eucharistic Congress, which is all a way to say that to you he's somewhat anonymous, and chances that you might ever see him again are probably very slim. So he is going to make himself available uh, for confession uh, uh, during the question and answer uh, session, and that's going to happen if you just go right up those stairs there. There's, you'll see a little room, it's kind of a little ante room, and it's very private, uh, nobody can hear, and so if uh, you feel so moved uh, to go to confession, uh, either because you like to regularly or you haven't been in a while, uh, you can go unload everything on him and you're never going to see him again. So, no worries. <laughs> uh, can everybody in the back hear me? We don't have a sound system, so just to make sure. Can you guys hear? Okay? All right, good. Um, we're talking about the church militant, which is just a, uh, uh, a term that the church has used in reference to the church on earth, uh, fighting, uh, that each one of us individually has to fight, uh, fight for the truth, fight to become uh, solid uh, Catholics by overcoming whatever our own dispositions for sin and our own weaknesses and failings are. And the sort of other side of that is to also fight collectively against whatever evils and uh, you know, horrible things may be happening in the world uh, collectively, specifically with regard, mostly, uh, with regard to um, uh, things that deny the truth, uh, various uh, 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 cultural mindsets that, that exclude the truth from, sort of, from the public debate. And uh, why is because they allow all kinds of evil to come about. If you don't plug into the truth and you don't understand the truth, you can't ever get to what is a truthful answer. So uh, the problem today when we talk about, you know, try to understand the church in the terms of church militant, fighting for truth and what is right and what is good, is that the culture has kind of excluded the idea that there is something as the right, and for that fact, the wrong. There are very few things today, if you were to go through and ask the world, particularly the Western world, because the Western world is what was, uh, you know, sort of a product of, of the Christian civilization, of the Catholic civilization. So if you go through and you sort of look at the damage that has happened to Western civilization, and you could somehow uh, you know, take a, a, a poll and ask everybody in the West, you know, what are the things that you would say are absolutely always forbidden? They're always wrong. They are absolutely wrong in every single circumstance. You'd get a very short list. Because practically, everybody believes that some kind of evil is permissible. You can just look in the West right away. And, you know, half of the people would say abortion is fine, because they do now. Uh, another half or another portion would say euthanasia. It's fine. Uh, some would say, uh, you know, uh, taking the cells of aborted babies and using them for medical research. Uh, and for cosmetics and things like that. Well, you know, that's all right. Why? Because people do it right now. They do that now. 
So if you'd ask them if they think it's wrong, they're not going to say, oh yeah, I think that's wrong, and then they go off and do it. So as you sort of go down the list, you start to realize that across Western civilization, in Europe, Canada, North America, Australia, New Zealand, the whole everything sort of influenced by Western civilization, there are very few things that would be on the list of the culture at large that would say, no, this is absolutely wrong, you can never do this. You couldn't say child murder because that happens about 100 million times a year in the form of abortion. So what exactly would be on the list of objectively wrong and evil, meaning it's always wrong and should never be done? Clearly, adultery wouldn't get on that list because tons of people commit adultery. Pornography, internet or you know, magazines or movies or whatever form, wouldn't get on that list because hundreds of millions of people participate in it. So what exactly in the culture is there that the culture would say is wrong. This should not be done. Now let's move over to the other side of the ledger. What, asking the same people, what would you say is uh, something that is right and should be done and everybody should do it? Well, it certainly wouldn't be worshiping God wouldn't be worshiping God. You know, less than 50% of people in Western civilization attend any form of religious service. Uh, it wouldn't be necessarily giving to the poor because lots of people don't do that. So when you whittle all of this down and you go through and you look at it, all of a sudden you realize that what for Western civilization for 1,500 years has accepted that all of these things are objectively immoral and evil and should not be done. And all of these things are objectively right and good and should be done. What that list, those lists used to be have become very, very short. Very short. So the idea that there is something that is objectively true and good and some things that are objectively true, uh, bad and evil... That's a thought that has now sort of left the way we live. That is the reason so many people who are Catholic have a difficult time understanding the church in the terms of the church militant. Because if you are a military and you are engaged in some sort of combat, some sort of military action, well, you're not just running around the field having skirmishes, shooting people for no reason. You're moving to some sort of objective. You know, you have to capture that hill or capture the capital of the enemy or whatever it is you do as a military. You just don't walk around and blow up landmines and throw grenades into people's yards for no reason. So as you're doing that as a military, well, you're aiming for something. You're trying to win the battle and win the next battle so you win enough battles and you win the war and you win and that's it. Well, the church is like that too. The church has to engage in this battle and that battle or whatever, not a violent battle, but because there's an aim. But if the people even in the church don't see that there isn't an objective truth that should be fought for, well, they're not going to begin to see themselves as soldiers or you know, uh, you know, warriors for the truth in any sort of way because they don't believe there is a the truth. Oh, yeah, this might be true today, but you know what? It might not be true tomorrow. So this whole sense of, of, uh, of vigor and a, and a, a, a sort of a, uh, you know, vim and vigor to fight for something isn't there because there isn't a belief that there's something there to fight for. And in the absence of that, there's no way some, it, it's, it would be ridiculous to expect people to view themselves in terms of the church militant, because they don't believe there's anything to fight for. If we don't believe that there's something worth fighting for, if that's the case, that means that we really don't believe in God. Now, we might believe in some kind of, I don't know, nostalgic way 
some sort of romantic kind of childhood fanciful way where, you know, we remember, you know, being this tall and kneeling down beside our bed saying our prayers at night and mommy was there and it was a nice kind of comforting thing. But the reality that all of that nostalgia pointed to, we simply don't accept anymore. We don't accept it as a people, I mean as a culture, Western culture. We certainly don't accept it by and large inside the church anymore. The members of the church, the individual, obviously the church, the body of Christ still believes that, but the individual members of the church don't. Too many of them don't. So what do they do? They make all kinds of decisions. All of the decisions that they make are based on not an objective reality, but wind up being based on just how they feel about something. You know, they kind of are the people, you know, who determine, oh, this is right or this is wrong for me. And how many times do you hear the, hear the point, well, you know, I, that's fine if you don't think that's right, but don't impose your stuff on me. And you wind up with that kind of attitude that, eh, there is no right or there is no wrong. Well, that, you cannot hold that position that everything's relative more morality is relative depending on who you are and what the circumstances are, and at the same time say you believe in God, the Christian God. You can say that I believe in Jesus, but you've made some other construct of Jesus in your mind that does not conform to the reality of who Christ is. Lots of people, I'll give you an example of this, I had a... Uh, uh, I was out from you know, three, maybe four years ago, I guess now. I'm not sure exactly when. A few years back. And uh, I was out praying in front of an abortion chamber uh, in Detroit. And a lady walked in, or was walking in, and she was visibly pregnant. And as she was walking in, the, you know, we were kind of across the street. A bunch of us were praying, but there were a couple of sidewalk counselors out there. And... Uh, we were close enough to hear one of the counselors say to her, um, uh, you know, don't, you know, you know, you don't, don't go in there, you know, you'll kill your baby, or, you know, it's going to bother you, or, you know, whatever it was he said, you know, you'll, you know, you'll be paying for this forever for yourself, you know, and, the, and she said to him, as I, I heard it with my own ears, she said, uh, oh, it's my, this is my third, nothing's happening to me, I'm fine with it, and she started to pull on the door, and he said, uh, and he started to say something to her uh, about Jesus. And she said, Jesus understands fine. He forgives everything. And in she walked. That's a twisted notion of Christ. Whatever she's got in her mind isn't Christ. I mean, yeah, down the road, if she's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? Blah, blah, blah. You know, if she seeks forgiveness, of course. But she has created a false Christ in her mind. And she thinks she's perfectly fine. And you'll see all kinds of things like, uh, 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 well, you know, here's a good one. I don't know if you're familiar. Are you familiar? You're familiar over here with the 40 Days for Life, right? Yeah, uh, the 40 Days for Life campaign. Planned Parenthood and the pro-abortion movement in the United States just started <laughs> a 40 Days for Abortion prayer campaign in the United States. These people are praying. I don't know where they're going. I'm standing in front of churches. I don't know what they're doing. But they pray for 40 consecutive days to God to keep abortion a good and safe, you know, wonderful legal thing. You're, you have an active prayer campaign to ask God to help you slaughter children. Wow. That is a perverse notion of what God is, of what truth is. So just because somebody says, oh yeah, I believe in God, well, do they believe in the objective reality of what God is, or do they believe in a God that they've set up of their own? They can even borrow and steal different terms from Christianity or Judaism, for that fact, and apply them to their God. But this is a false god that they've just taken some gold from other things and hammered over and, you know, pasted on top of their god. So it looks Christian or Jewish, 
it looks that way, but at the end of the day, it's, there isn't a Christian or Jewish you know, bone of truth in it. And when you have a culture that is continually living in this false notion that God is just you know, who you say it is, it is, well, when that's the case, how are Catholics to be able to understand the idea that we have to go and fight that. The idea of fighting that, this is why every time as a Catholic you say, oh, you know, this contraception's wrong, that's evil, you know, divorce and remarriage is evil, uh, except, you know, name any moral evil you want. You say this is evil, and people will hit you right back. Don't be so judgmental. You get that right immediately back because it's sort of the knee-jerk reaction from a culture that does not want to accept truth. There is either objective truth or there is not. There can't be sometimes objective truth and other times not. It's not possible. And one of the big problems, one of the sort of big preconditions that has occurred in the culture is that the ability to think rationally, to think logically, to approach a situation from a pure intellectual standpoint. I don't mean Einstein, I mean simply using our uh, spiritual faculty of our intellect has been shoved aside. We are a culture that thrives on being entertained. We're a culture that simply does not want to sit around and think about paying the price for this or that. Uh, you know, if you look at just, uh, you can see this kind of writ large in the economic disaster uh, that's befalling uh, Europe, working its way across the United States, uh, North America. Uh, because people have made certain choices in their lives, and enough people have done and made these choices, What's happened is that the human cycle of life, how we live our lives, has become so altered that the economy has had to follow suit and it too has been altered. What is an economy? An economy is nothing more than just the, you know, all the sum total of how people interact with each other based on what? based on how they live their lives, the sort of human cycle of life. So, you know, people who are in their 80s aren't going around borrowing $300,000. They don't need it. They don't want to buy a house. They don't need, you know, this, that, or the other. But people in their 20s or 30s do because they're starting families and they need to, you know, get this and that. And they need to furnish homes and cars and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, there's, there's a, just a natural cycle there. And it's out of the natural cycle of how people live that an economy spills out. Well, when you alter the way people live, their human uh, cycle, the natural cycle of their human life, well, of course the economy is going to be altered. And it just stands to reason. It's just common sense. You don't need some great big you know, PhD in economics to understand that. So what happened? How has, why are the economies screwed up? Why are the world economies screwed up? Because people made choices about how they lived their lives, uh, moral choices. They chose to essentially stop having children or stop having children at such a rate that economies shifted dramatically. In the United States, uh, in the next uh, six to seven years, I believe it is, I didn't refresh the numbers in my brain, but it's close to that. In the next six to seven years, there will be, right now, there's still more money being paid in to the Social Security Trust Fund, which I'm not sure if you, I don't know if you have something like that here in Australia or not, but the, you know, Social Security, once you turn 65, you've been paying into this for your whole life, now you get to start pulling out. It's just kind of like a little insurance thing, gives you a few hundred bucks a month in your pocket to spend money on, uh, to, you know, to have spending money. Um, that uh, system, uh, the whole Social Security system, uh, right now has enough money going into it each year so that as people are pulling it out, also at the same time, there's still enough money to cover it. But the rate at which it's being paid into is on a steep decline. 
So in the next six to seven years, there will be as much money poured into it as will be taken out of it. In the next year, there will not be enough money put into it as there will to cover the cost of what's being taken out. So now you start spending more than you're actually taking in. And in 20 years, that or I'm sorry, 15 years, that uh, amount of money, the sort of the kitty, the bank account they have now, will be drained and gone. And you will have, that'll affect me. <laughs> I turned 65 in 15 years. I've paid into that system my entire life. My entire life. And I'll walk up to the window and say, okay, here, I'm 65, here's my card, give me my money. And they'll say, they'll pull down the shade and go, sorry, out of business, and that's it. And all the people that made all the politicians who made all the promises about this 20, 30, 40 years ago, guess what? They're all dead. And they're not around anymore. Why did this happen? Because the culture of the United States made a decision back in the 1960s that it is perfectly fine to stop reproducing and started aborting and birth controlling itself out of existence. When Social Security was set up back in the 1930s, for every person drawing out of it, 42 people were paying into it. Today, today, for every person drawing out of it, two are paying into it. That's not sustainable. And because it has now become so ingrained that this is the cycle of how we live our lives, you have 1.3 children and that's it. Because those are the choices that the culture has made. The moral, cult, the moral choice has been made. Because of that, that's it. Now that spills over into the economy and there's no getting it back. You can't all of a sudden produce 60 or 70 million people who were never born because they were, they were either contracepted before they uh, you know, were allowed to be created or they were uh, aborted as a result of the contraception or they were simply surgically aborted. You can't just drop 60 million people into your culture as consumers and say start spending, working, getting jobs and pouring into the system so 15 years from now I have money when I go to draw out my, draw out my social security. Moral choices have impact on economies because they affect the way, uh, they, they alter the natural human cycle. So because a moral choice was made that the objective truth that marriage is for not just the union of man and woman, husband and wife, but also for the procreation and propagation of the race, because a moral choice was made to separate those two goods, those two ends of marriage, and you can simply commit an immoral act for your own pleasure, because of that, now we are now seeing the results of that. And that's exactly what's happening in Europe as well. There simply aren't enough people being born uh, to be able to pay the cost of what's, you know, the, the people on the older end who are drawing down from the system. So, what does all this have to do with the church militant? That is a hard case, real world example of what happens when an objective truth is simply disregarded, when it simply is treated as though there is no objective truth. Do what you want as a culture. This is how civilizations rise and fall. Every civilization has come to this point. If you go and read uh, the, the Roman emperor who, <clears throat> excuse me, the Roman emperor who uh, reigned down the worst persecution on the church uh, was Diocletian. Uh, and... Uh, and he was uh, killing off Catholics like mad more than uh, any other emperor had done around the year 280, uh, from 280 to about 300, those sort of last 20 years or so of his reign, uh, 20 or 30 years of his reign. Uh, but it's interesting, if you go read his writings, the same thing was going on inside the Roman Empire. All of a sudden, people, they weren't, contraception wasn't obviously as effective in that case because it wasn't chemical, it was a number of other things. But they would just have children and kill them. 
They wouldn't abort them. In a really kind of twisted sense of things, abortion was looked on as this horrible, which, is, which it is, this horrible, rotten, disgusting, immoral, murderous act. But once the baby was born, moments later, you could take the baby and run out to the hill and put him on the hill and then leave him and let the wolves come and devour him. That was okay. Infanticide was perfectly acceptable, but abortion, no, no, that's a, that's a bad thing. Uh, but if you read through Diocletian's uh, uh, letters and his directives, he said uh, that there simply weren't enough people. There weren't enough natural-born Roman citizens, so the economy started falling apart. So he, the emperor, stepped in and started taking state control of every major operation there was uh, in the economy. It changed from what was essentially capitalism to a really heavy-handed socialism. Why? Because people made certain choices. Sin has an effect in this life as well as the next. Our primary concern obviously should be the next, but for somebody who doesn't want to sit around and talk about objective morality and they don't believe it and all of that, well, you know, okay, so lay that argument aside for a moment and approach the reality of, well, here's what happens just here on earth. Let's say we die and turn to dust and that's the end of it. You're going to have a really miserable way on your way to being a pile of dust because here's what happens eventually. And the church, because of who founded her, knows the truth of moral choices in this life and the next and proposes that there is such a thing as objective morality, meaning this is a good thing and should always be done, and this is a bad thing and should never be done. And when the church holds out that objective moral teaching, and there's no Catholics to sort of rush to the barricades to defend it and then promote it and then go on the attack, everything crumbles apart. This is true of the whole uh, you know, homosexual marriage scene uh, or civil unions, whatever you know, the government wants to you know, put a disguise on the language. It's all effectively the same thing. Uh, contraception, abortion, sterilization, euthanasia, all of these things. You know, are they objectively moral or are they not? They can't be amoral. They can't be amoral unless you simply don't have any sort of real sense of the value of human life. And if you don't have a sense of value of human life, then you simply don't believe in God. You don't believe in the objective truth of what God is. You've created some false God in your head or you just disregard it. Uh, a term I came across a couple years ago that I think makes an awful lot of sense is practical atheism. People walk around and say they believe in God and they'll shake hands and they'll show up at people's weddings and oh that's wonderful and funerals and they'll cross themselves and this and that. But they don't that they live their lives in practice as though they are atheists. They simply don't think about God ever. Not in any substantive way. They don't think they have to be in any kind of prayer life communion with him. They don't think that he has to be the most important thing in their life, even above themselves and their family. They simply do not view God in that way. They have some weird New Age version of what God is, uh, or that he's just some, or it is just some amorphous cloud up there. Uh, or some thing that started the universe a trillion, billion, gazillion years ago and doesn't really have any kind of interplay in our lives now and whatever happens to us, happens to us. And have totally missed the point that we were created for God, by God, to be with Him. They've missed that point. That's, in the end, what God is. God is the supreme being who creates man so that man can be with him for eternity. That's an objectively true statement. If someone does not accept that statement, 
then they simply cannot uh, uh, accept the idea that there is objective morality. They don't have an objectively truthful version of God in which to root their objective morality. So there's this interplay back and forth. If you don't believe in God, you have no objective morality, which means you're capable of anything. Now, maybe you're not. You know, 60 years out of your life, you would never dream of going killing somebody. Ah, oh, but on your 61st birthday, you know what? It's an option. Why? It has to be an option. Intellectually, philosophically, it has to be an option because there's absolutely no reason for you to say, no, I won't do that. You might say, oh, I'm afraid I, you know, I'll get caught and I'll wind up in jail. Okay, that doesn't make you moral. You can't be moral by lack of opportunity. I was going to rob the bank, and I had my ski mask on, and I was walking in the door with the gun, and I saw, oh my gosh, there's a police convention inside here. I'm going to turn around and walk out. That doesn't make you moral. That just means you got bad timing. So, somebody who does not have a sense of objective morality doesn't believe in God. And somebody who doesn't believe in God can't see the truth of what the church is. And people inside the church, Catholics inside the church, first of all, most of them don't go to Mass. Most of them have been to confession and, you know, whatever, you know, probably since the crucifixion. Why? Because they have no sense of sin. They have no sense of real right and wrong. Because they have no sense of morality. So... They might feel, if they're involved in the hookup culture, you know, meat market, whatever you want to call it, you know, they might think that's, you know, eh, maybe that's not the best way to be, but, you know, whatever, what's the big deal? And off they run, off to the hookup culture. And they might feel bad and do the walk of shame, uh, you know, the next morning, but they get over it pretty quickly. You know, by the time the afternoon rolls around, they're okay, and they're kind of geared up for, you know, tonight's action. And that's just how they view the world. It's how they view themselves. And if you mention God to them, again, they're dealing with either the no God concept or the, I don't know, he's up there somewhere, but that's the end of it. Or they simply have no relation, no understanding of God at all. So, inside the church, for Catholics to not understand that the church on earth is the church militant means that those Catholics simply do not believe in Jesus Christ the way Jesus Christ has asked us to believe in Him, has commanded us to believe in Him. If you don't see that your duty, your obligation, is to be in, literally, this man's army, then you don't believe. You don't believe enough. At least the people who got up and walked out of the church, the 80% of Catholics, the four out of five, at least they have some sort of integrity. They say, I don't believe this, and I'm going to leave because I don't believe it. But for the people who stay in the church, or at least stay you know, somehow tied to the church, at least visibly, if not interiorly, well, but they don't really believe what the church, what are they doing? You know? Take a hike. Go. But if you look at the reality and apply your intellect to the weight, this can't be right, this wrong thing cannot be right, or this right thing cannot be wrong, because my mind, my intellect is telling me this simply can't be the case. If you ever want to know if an action is morally right or wrong, ask yourself, what if everyone on the earth did it? And if that's the case, 99% of the time you're going to arrive at the truthfulness or the morality of a, of, a, of a proposition almost immediately. What if everyone on the earth did it? If everyone on the earth had an abortion, we'd be gone in 20 years. The entire human race would be gone in 20 years. If uh, everybody robbed banks, there'd be no economy. There'd be pure chaos. If everybody went around shooting each other, if everybody went around stealing from each other, if everybody went around and perjured themselves in court, 
put their hand on the Bible or whatever they do in courts today and said, I swear, and sat down and just blathered out lies, the entire judicial system would fall apart like that. If police knowingly made false arrests and just threw people in jail because they wanted to, the entire uh, law and order system of every culture would just completely come tumbling down. Everything we do is based on a certain set of presuppositions that this is moral, and it's moral because. Then figure out the because. But the problem in the church today is people really don't believe the faith. They really don't believe the faith. They don't believe really what the church is. Too many people don't believe or believe enough, or they haven't thought this through. And they haven't thought it through because everywhere they look, there's a million distractions for them to never really think it through. They never have to really sit and concentrate on the truth of something because there's always another video game to play. There's always another zombie to shoot. There's always another movie to go see. There's always another club to go check out. There's always another person to lust after. And there's always tomorrow to change. And one day, there will, there will not be a tomorrow. Every one of us is on borrowed time, and we have no idea how much time we have. And that is precisely how the diabolical wants it. The diabolical does not want the human intellect because it is a spiritual faculty. It is a spiritual faculty ultimately aimed at the being able to apprehend and capture joy. And it does not want that being available. So it has to distract. It can't destroy the intellect, but it can distract the intellect. It can turn the intellect from joy, which is its object, and bring in the body and its senses, which goes after pleasure. And every day, there's something always new, pleasurable. You can eat too much. You can uh, drink too much. You can do a 100,000 different things and never get around in your life to asking the question, what is the purpose of my life? Even if that question comes into your mind, you barely have a second or two to dwell on it before hey, there's some you know, uh, Playboy Channel thing on HBO, or I'm driving down the street and there's some billboard up there just advertising some kind of wild sex, whatever. Or there's some kind of like, hey, buy this car and 7,000 you know, of the most beautiful women in the earth will fawn all over you, or whatever it is. There's a reason advertisers do that. I mean, think about advertising, which is really how the diabolical gets sold, isn't it? It's really advertising. You know, you look at a car, look at a car commercial on TV, and at the end of the, and I know this because I used to produce commercials for General Motors, and I used to work in news too, and I dealt with the guys in the sales and advertising things. I was in this industry for 20 years. I know how it works. So what do you do? If you want to sell something, you create an image around it. You create a feeling around it. You create a sense around it. But you don't ever really talk about the it. You will be very hard pressed to sit there and watch a car commercial on television, <clears throat> a standard 30 second car commercial, and walk away knowing, okay, this is how much it costs. Um, you know, so manufacturers such a price, you know, models shown $20 million more. Um, uh, you won't really know much about the car itself. You might, if there's some kind of new fancy feature in it, like, you know, the stick shift is made of gold bullion or something, they'll show you that. But, you know, you're not going to know much about the car. You're not going to know, you know, you know this, is the, this is sort of the lower end version of this car that we just have to sell so we can keep up with the competition of our other guys. We really think it's kind of a piece of junk, but, you know, we've just taken one label off and slapped on another and jacked up the price $3,000 to send it. Oh, no. Well, of course they're not going to tell you that, because you wouldn't buy it. But they want your money. Well, Satan wants your soul. And he's going to dress things up like that. What the advertisers do is they create this beautiful aura 
around this cheap piece of garbage car. And you see shots of it like really tight, like the boom, the wheel going through. Well, gee, that's shocking. I mean, all cars are supposed to roll, aren't they? And, you know, you see some, you know, fantastic stud driving it or, you know, looks over his foster gramps or something. And, you know, or the most beautiful woman in the world and, you know, stepping in, stepping in or stepping out on her way to the most chic club, in the, which has told me absolutely nothing about the car which is what you want me to shell out 30000 or $40,000 for. I know nothing about what I'm paying for, but here's your thirty or $40,000. Okay, where's the babe? Oh, no, that's, that's different. That's a different order. And that's how sin and attraction works. Deflect your intellect. Every advertising is based on that. Either confound your intellect, confuse it, lie to it, or simply disengage it and present something that has nothing to do with what you're buying. That's the entire principle advertising is based on. Nobody stands on the air and says, hello, would you please buy my product? Here are the good points about it, and here are the bad points about it. Nobody does that. Why don't they? Because they don't want you looking, taking an intellectual look at their, what they're proposing to you to buy or rent or whatever it is. Because then you're like, oh, okay, now I'm not emotionally attached to this product anymore. Now I'm just looking at this as a proposition, an intellectual proposition. Should I rent this apartment or should I rent that apartment? That's it. It's just cal calm, cool, collected. You won't make an emotional decision. And that's exactly what advertisers want you to do. They want you to make an emotional decision, devoid of the intellect, or at least the intellect, a clear intellect. That's exactly what the diabolical wants you to do. Wants you to make a decision, a moral decision, based on senses, feelings, pleasures, and not look at the intellectual aspect of what it is. It's how the spiritual battle is engaged. And when the church militant is not in that battle, then the diabolical wins. It's just really this simple. You don't need, you know, 50 years of theology degrees and, you know, some kind of psychological training for this or that. You don't need any. This is just really that simple. Ten-year-olds can figure this out. Now, they might not be able to articulate it in, you know, the same language that somebody who has a degree in theology or psychology or something does, but who cares? Nobody has to stand in front of God on Judgment Day and explain, you know, why they didn't get a degree in theology or economics or psychology. But they do have to explain why they chose to do what they did. Why they chose to kill this child. Why they chose to cohabitate with this guy or this girl. Why they chose to do this. Why they, cho why they got divorced and, you know, remarried and two or three times and left fatherless children in their track who grew up with no man to show them how to be a man or a woman. Oh, sure, all of those things have to be explained. And even if you had a theology, economic, and philosophy, and psychology degree, it would do you no good standing in front of our Lord. As a matter of fact, it would probably make you more condemnable. The church militant needs to re-adapt to itself that understanding that we are in a fight. Me, interiorly, for my soul, you, each one of you and everybody for their souls and, and collectively for the souls of everyone we know and love. There is objective truth. If there's not objective truth, then there is no objective morality. And if there is no objective morality, then why is what Hitler did wrong? Why is what Stalin did, killing 25 million of his own, and then another 20 million in his fake show trials, why is that wrong? You can't say, well, it's not nice, and who cares if it's nice or not? You know, don't impose your standard of nice on me. Don't be so judgmental. I happen to think it's very nice. I'm Adolf Hitler. I think it's nice to rid the world of these vermin Jews. Don't impose your standard of nice on me. See, there has to be an authority outside of each one of what we think.
There is an objective standard, and it must be the case. Because without it, it's nothing but chaos. And we see that breaking apart right now. We see all of that breaking down in the culture. Culture is breaking apart. Now, we're seeing it in economic terms, but the reason we see it in economic terms is because it has already been ravaged through moral terms. When civilizations fall apart, uh, people, you know, very smart people have observed who study all of this stuff and write about it, you know, incessantly, that there are three things that happen, three sort of stages that a civilization goes through on its way to crumbling. The first is a moral collapse, followed by and, uh, and as a result of the moral collapse, the economic collapse, and when that happens, the political collapse falls, and that's it. And people lose faith in the government because the government can't fix the economic problems. And the economic problems are there not because of the government so much, because of the choices of the people. So does this sound familiar from the Garden of Eden? Look at the horrible thing you've done. Why did you do it, Adam? It's her fault. Eve, look what you've done. Why did you do this? I don't blame the serpent. People... Wh Think about this. People in Greece are rioting. People in France are rioting. They're rioting because the government is taking away what it's been giving them for years. Why was it giving it to them for years? Because initially, when all of these horrible moral choices were being made, there was enough of a sort of a cachet, there was enough of a bank account built up that you could you know, spend this money and give it out. But there comes the point where you've run out of money. Where you've simply run out of money. And now the people who benefited, who, you know, kind of did whatever they wanted to do, morally and everything else, and figured out oh, there's no consequences of this. What's the big deal? So who cares if the age of the population shifts and there's not enough people to pay for it? Well, now the government says, well, geez, if we don't come in here and make these massive cuts, I mean, I don't want to take a, you know, a surgeon's scalpel, we need to take an axe and chop off a third of this. Well, now all of a sudden, everybody's upset. And so they riot. These measures are too austere. We can't do this. Riots happening in Italy, starting to happen all over Europe. This isn't going to end. They're not going to be able to fix this. It's going to get worse. It has to get worse because... We're sort of in the leading edge of what is the economic collapse. You see this everywhere. Very uh, attuned to it in the United States. You know, not to talk about a politic thing, but just give you, you know, a little sample. When Obama came into office, the entire debt of the nation over the course of 200, whatever it is, 30 or 40 years had accumulated to 10, uh, 10 trillion dollars. It took 200 and, you know, call it roughly 250 years, 250 years to run up $10 trillion debt. In three years as president, he's added $6 trillion to it. And if he were, God forbid, to get elected again, in eight years, one guy would add more debt to the future of the United States than everybody who had preceded him all the way back to the War of Independence with the British. That's stunning. Matter of fact, he would hit that number in his fifth year in office, two years from now. So, <clears throat> but why is he able to do that? When these economies are falling apart like this, how's it? Because he just has to keep spending. You know, moral choices, I want to get into political things. I'm just trying to like break it down for you and get it away from the theological terms because theological terms always seem so murky to people. Let's break down that sin has an effect in this life, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as the next. <coughs> has an effect in both aspects of our lives. When, when the church militant, that's us, does not respond and understand that it has a responsibility to save, save the world from its own bad choices, <laughs> absolutely, Absolutely. That's the point of grace. That's why you're baptized. That's why you're in a state of sanctifying grace. And if you're not in a state of sanctifying grace, Father Paul will be back there for confessions in 10 minutes. Get in a state of sanctifying grace. The church has taught, still teaches, always will, that 
that human faculty, that spiritual faculty of the intellect, becomes darkened by sin. Kind of like the lights go out. You can't think straight anymore with regard to moral choices. You lose the ability to see clearly. <clears throat> Where does the intellect come from? Where does the human intellect come from? Well, ultimately it comes from God. When God says, let us make man in our own image, in the divine image he created them, male and female. Well, what are we? We are spiritual beings that have flesh. We are ensouled flesh. We are materialized spirits. And because of that, the spiritual aspect of what we are, the, our, our spirits, which are intellect and free will, those come from God. Because that's what God is. God is the supreme spirit. And the ability to reason and make a judgment and choose the good comes from the divine. If we blot out that sort of divine image, if we darken it inside ourselves by making bad moral choices, then that spark that we have of the divine in us becomes crippled. Our spiritual faculty of being able to intellectually work our way through something becomes hampered, and eventually we lose it. And we just make bad choices over and over and over again. Bad moral choices. And we know that, it prob I'm sure most of you in here, if you don't know someone personally, you've heard of someone else's story that says, you know, no matter what he or she does, they just always do the wrong thing. No matter what they do, it always turns out bad. It seems like it's going along fine at first, but then their whole world comes falling down. She's always in love with the wrong guy. Uh, you know, he's always running around cheating on his wife with this one and that one. And you hear this all the time. Why? Why? Why are you so able to sit there and look at, the, look at it and clearly understand it for what it is, yet the person in it can never seem to make the right choice? They're always choosing the wrong mate or the wrong decision or the wrong action. Or, why? Because to them, they simply can't see the truth because their intellects are blinded by their sin. When you are in a state of mortal sin, the lights go out. You are dead spiritually. That's what the term mortal sin means. And everybody on earth is either in a state of mortal sin or a state of grace. There is no in-between. You know, the lights in this room are on or they're off. Even if they were on some sort of dimmer and you had them turned down to 1%, and that's the only light you had, some dim little glow of a light, they'd still be on. You know, you can't be sort of pregnant. You either are or you aren't. The light is either on or off. When we who are Catholics have the opportunity to be in a state of grace, and we get into a state of grace through, uh, well, immediately through participation in the sacraments, um, and staying in the sacramental life, that's why these people who are in a continual state of grace really don't seem to have these problems in their lives because they have the intellectual capacity and the intellectual, the illumination because of grace, because the intellect comes from God, and if it's with God, it sees things in a more pure way, a more realistic way. It doesn't succumb to passions and rotten, stupid choices that are driven because of sensuality, but it makes the decision in sort of the clear, blinding light of truth. So somebody who's in a state of grace, doesn't mean you're not tempted, but somebody who's in a state of grace, think about this. Here's a husband. He's in a state of grace. You know, he goes to Mass every week. He tries to raise his children correctly in the faith. You know, all the different things that you would imagine. He has a prayer life, all these things. He, he's trying to be a good Catholic. Okay, he's doing his thing. 
In comes to his office, you know, Miss Bombshell. She's just the hottest thing ever in the history of the world. And he looks at her. Now, this man is in a state of grace. And as long as he remains in a state of grace, his mind will be able to look at that temptation as, wow, she's really fantastic. Yeah, you know what? I really think I would like to have sex with her. But if I do that, I betray myself, I betray my children, I betray my wife, I betray everything, I will destroy the life I have for a quick sexual thrill. And he's able to think in those terms because his intellect is illumined. He understands. And how is his intellect illumined? Because he's in a state of grace. Being in a state of grace doesn't mean that you're somehow freed from temptation. It means you have the ability to look at the temptation, weigh it up, and no matter how thrilling it might be and how desirous it might be, you have the grace of the Holy Trinity in you to be able to resist the temptation. That's being militant. That's fighting for the truth. Now let's go over here to Harry. Harry, Harry is a Catholic who hasn't been to confession in umpteen years. You know, he doesn't know, you know, so I don't really believe it. It's not, yeah, there's a God somewhere. He's nice. You know, I don't know. I mean, we're all, we all die. We go to heaven. What's the big difference? I know it's all the same difference. Blah, 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 blah. Dude, she, she's hot. Hey, sweetheart. What are, you, what are you doing after work? He doesn't even stop to think about the ramifications of what's going to happen to his life. Why? Because his intellect is dimmed, if not totally gone, with, with regard to morality. It's just dimmed. It's certainly, however bright it is, whatever might be left of it, is not as bright as the first guy's. This guy understands what love is, that love is sacrifice. The first guy understands that love is sacrifice and willing the good of the other, even at the expense of yourself, burning yourself out for it if need be. That's what a martyr is. You know, I've spent my entire life doing this, Lord, and now they've come to get me, and after 35 years of being whatever a good Catholic and loving you as best I've been able to and whatever the circumstances are of my life, here in the 35th year and the first day, all I'm going to do is just take the last step in loving you. I've already done this. I've, I'm already at the 99th step. Why wouldn't I take the 100th? For the martyrs, it probably wasn't that big of a deal. Most of them went willingly to it. Where'd they get that courage from? They got the courage because they knew intellectually. They knew what was waiting for them on the other side. They'd lived their entire lives like this. Why were they going to change now at the very last second? And the same is true of the other guy. Now, can there be deathbed conversions? Sure there can. Can people make all of a sudden a radical turnaround change as they're facing death? Sure they can. But where are they going to get the assist for that to happen? There's a, I can't remember who the saint was who said it, but uh, he said, as you live, so shall you die. That makes sense. That makes sense. As you live, so shall you die. That doesn't mean abandon all hope if you are uh, in a state of sin. It means get yourself into a state of grace. And at any instant, particularly, especially, or as a Catholic, you have that available to you anytime you want. You just, boom, go to confession, and bam, it's like you're back from your baptism. And it doesn't matter what it was. It doesn't matter what it was you went and confessed. As a matter of fact, the greater it was, the bigger the party in heaven. And a few uh, priest friends of mine who've said that sometimes when people who are in, like, always in a state of grace and going to them, going to confession, you know, they go in and they tell, like, you know, which I'm, I don't know, I would think for a priest is a kind of a, from a human perspective, kind of a boring confession. 
Uh, they say it's like being stoned to death with popcorn. <laughs> These little itty bitty, like, oh, are you really? Uh, you know, so, you know, but think about what happens in heaven, as our blessed Lord said, when, uh, uh, you know, when a sinner, a great sinner returns, there is more joy in heaven from the, for the one who came back than the 99 who stayed. And not only is there joy in heaven, the person becomes a new creation. The person becomes a new creation. You walk out of confession. You walk out of confession. If you went in there dead, you come out raised from the dead. That's the point. And not only are you restored to relationship and a life in God, now, now you're able to sort of step back because you have the Holy Trinity in you. The indwelling of the Holy Trinity is there. You have the ability to look at your life now and make an ascent, the moral aspects, not like should I take this job or that job, but more, the moral aspects of your life, the things that would lead you to or away from God. You can look at these in the blinding light of the truth. And sometimes, yeah, the truth, many times, the truth is hard to choose. To do what's right is hard to choose. To do what is, uh, uh, is wrong is easy. We all know that. But to know what the truth is and see it clearly is the benefit of being a Catholic in a state of grace. And from the perspective of the church militant, you can't complain about what's going on in the culture if you can't clean up your own act first. And that's what it means to be in the church militant, to go out and fight for truth. And remember, at the end of the day, truth is our Lord. It's not a concept. It's not a philosophical concept like Plato and Socrates treated it as. It is a person, and he said so himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life.